Welcome everybody to Rutgers Center for Chinese Studies. My name is Tao Jiang. I'm the director of the center. Please visit us online uh, at, Rutgers, uh, at rccs.rutgers.edu uh, to follow the, the most recent events. Uh, you can also uh, subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, uh, facebook.com slash Rutgers CCS. So we're really delighted tonight to have um, Professor Shu Xiangcheng as our guest speaker today. Um, professor Xiang is an assistant professor in the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at Peking University in Beijing, China. She received her bachelor's degree in architecture from the University of Cambridge, uh, MA in comparative literature from Penn State, another MA in philosophy from University of Hawaii, and PhD in philosophy from Humboldt University in Berlin and King's College London. This is a joint PhD degree. She's the author of A Philosophical Defense of Culture, Perspectives from Confucianism and Kasura, which is forthcoming from SUNY later this year. She's also the author of uh, articles in various areas uh, of philosophy, including comparative philosophy, history of Western philosophy, metaphysics, um, classical Chinese philosophy, and critical philosophy of race. Uh, the title of her talk tonight is A Philosophical Defense of Culture, Perspectives from Confucianism and Kasura. Um, Professor Xian. Okay, thank you so much. Um, so first of all, thank you, Dr. Xiang, for you know, inviting me to come give this talk. And I'm really, really happy um, to be able to share my work with everybody. And thank you all so much for you know, coming to listen to me. Um, so I'm speaking to you from, from Beijing, where it's very, very cold. Um, my windows are frozen from last night. OK, so I'm going to time myself to make sure I don't, I don't go over. So I'm going to set a stopwatch. OK. Um, so. Great, so I'm going to talk to you about, um, it's obviously a philosophical defense of culture perspectives from Confucianism and Kassira, and that's the title of my forthcoming book, and um, which was based on my, the dissertation that I wrote at the Humble and King's College London. So, oh, trying to, well, it's weird when I'm, I can't, uh, can't uh, change my slide. Sorry, I'm gonna to have to stop share. I don't, I don't know why I can't. Oh no, here we go. I had to click it. That's so strange. Okay, so, um, so what I'm gonna do for for the talk today is I'm gonna first of all introduce who Kassira is uh, because I think he's not really a very well known uh, philosopher. So I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people, you know, haven't really heard of him or don't, or even if they have heard of him, I'm not quite sure what he's actually about. So I'll introduce him. And then also introduce why it is I'm picking out this aspect of culture in relation to Confucianism. Um, you know, I don't really necessarily get the sense from previous scholarship that that's something that gets tied together with Confucianism. I think we have much more of a uh, typical understanding of uh, moral philosophy with relation to Confucianism. So I'll also explain why it is in my project, I uh, ended up joining this aspect of culture with Confucianism. Um, and, and then how that also fits with the work of Kassira, who is actually um, seen as one of the most prominent, if not the most prominent philosopher of culture in the, in, you know, I guess the Western tradition. Um, and then I also want, need to explain why culture in general, why it is I decided to, you know, focus on this particular theme as a thing that joins Kassira and Confucianism, why it is I even felt the necessary to defend culture, you know, what even is culture as a, philosoph as a philosophical concept. Um, and then part of explaining why I want to work on this issue of culture is to, to explain what culture is. At, by my meaning, my definition of what culture is. And obviously my definition of culture would have something to do with the um, Confucian and Kassirian account of culture, uh, which I think is you know, largely commensurable as I argue in my, in my project. And then after having laid down that kind of groundwork, I will then proceed to give you a um, summary, a chapter by chapter summary of my, of my book uh, to give us a kind of overview of the kind of places that my that my project takes us and the kind of 
um, arguments that I that I make and how they how the different chapters relate to each other. And then just finally, I will just briefly finish with how I continuing with these uh, with these themes in my in my present work. How you know I, I continue with these ideas further. Okay, so I will get started. Kasira, who who is Kasira? Um, well, Kasira, uh, he was um, he was German. He was born in 1874 and died in 1945, just a, just a little while before the end of the, uh, before the Nazi um, surrender. He was Jewish and was born in, um, in the German city of Breslau. Um, he, in 1892, he matriculated at the University of Berlin. So he was first, his dad was trying to make him study law as fathers tend to make, make you do, but then he wanted to study um, Germanistics, so he was doing German studies. But while he was doing that, he encountered um, the sociologist George Zimmel, who um, talked to him about this incredible group of scholars, well, one scholar in particular, um, a neo-Kantian called Hermann Cohen at the University of Marburg, and said that he was a brilliant scholar and the Kassira was fascinated, and then so he went to study with Hermann Cohen. And then um, in, in 1896, um, and then uh, so after he graduated, after he um, graduated from his from his doctoral studies, he actually found it difficult to to get a post for a while because of his uh, uh, Jewish heritage. Uh, but that his luck really changed in 1919 when he was offered the chair of the um, University of University of Hamburg, which was a newly established university, and that was. Uh, quite a important part of Kassira's biography, um, the University of Hamburg, because here he met the Abbey Warburg, the famous art historian. He was going to have a quite a formative um, influence on his work and he, he on him as well. So that was, you know, um, quite a mutually influential encounter. Uh, and, but then, uh, obviously, he lived in tragic times in 1933. He sensed that things were, weren't right, and he decided to leave um, Germany with his family, and then really spent the remainder of his life in exile, um, first in England, and then in, in Sweden, and then in the USA. Um, uh, and then he, in 1945, he died of a heart attack on, in, in New York because uh, he was, his last post was actually at the University of Columbia. Um, and like I said, it was just a little while before the, um, the end of the second world war, so he never actually got to see it, unfortunately. And I want to place the work of Kassira in a, something of a historical context, because um, he has, a, I think it's, it's interesting to, to see him in relation to the history of philosophy. So if we think of um, classical German philosophy, we have Kant, and then uh, in the post-Kantian period, we have a turn towards language, culture, and history with figures such as Herder, who has um, been seen as uh, one of the first figures um, formatively influential for the rise of anthropology, for example. And then you have the, you know, the growth of the human sciences with figures, with many, many figures, um, including Herder. And then you also have the Goethe, great humanist, and then uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, the great linguist. So that's the, that post-Kantian period. Um, and then we have that period of German idealism with uh, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, who were trying to work out some of the implications of the Kantian system. Um, and then, you know, largely we can say philosophy moves on to the post-Hegelian period. That's kind of like a watershed moment with Hegel, so in, in the post-Hegelian period, we have um, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and obviously Marx. But, uh, but then in the 20th century, we have um, this, in Germany, a movement that wants to return to Kant after the, the um, dominance of Hegelian philosophy. And then we have the uh, two movements in this neo-Kantian um, school. One um, is the Southwestern School, and then the school that we're concerned with, the Marburg School, whom Kassira is seen as a, as a um, fellow of. So we have his teachers, Hermann Cohen and Paul Natop, and then, and then Kassira. So normally, normally if you go on the, you know, Stanford Encyclopedia, et cetera, they tend to just, they, you know, Kassira is first of all identified as a Neo-Kantian. So 
Um, and then I think the next watershed is the post-war period. And I've picked out quite a few, I think the most representative uh, philosophers of the post-war period. So obviously you have Heidegger and then Adorn Adorno, um, Gadamer, the Germans, and then the French philosophers who were influenced by Hegelianism, so Sartre, Deleuze, and then perhaps Wittgenstein representing Anglophone, uh, a philosophy of language. And then in the German, German world, political philosophy represented by Habermas, and then in the, in the United States, um, political philosophy represented by John Rawls. So obviously there are other figures in here, but um, that, that can be seen as representative of post-war philosophy. But I picked out a few, and my point is, uh, none of the influential people in this list or in the 20th century have anything to do with Kassira. Kassira, he stood at a particular moment in history um, where he was the heir of, you know, this classical German period. Uh, but then he, his influence kind of dis absolutely disappears for various reasons um, in the post-war period. And that's why uh, we don't tend to hear very much about him. Uh, so. For example, um, Adorno, uh, Theodore Adorno called Kassira totally gaga. And then the, the English philosopher Isaiah Berlin called Kassira serenely innocent. And I don't think that uh, Berlin meant that in a, kind of, in, a, in a nice sense, in a positive sense. I think he's being derogatory. Kassira is, tends to be seen as somebody whose work was part of a world that's long gone and disappeared post the second world was a watershed. His, his philosophy is completely naive, very, very learned, but has nothing of relevance really to say to, to the world that we, we live in now. Um, so I think, you, you know, that's the, that's the picture of how Kassira is, um, is, tends to be seen as being situated. Okay. Um, right. So now I want to just explain, so, about Kassira's symbolic forms because his most famous works are um, a three volume trilogy called the philosophy of symbolic forms. And then and later in life in 1944, when he was in the United States, he actually rewrote the philosophy of symbolic forms um, in a small volume and uh, renamed it an essay on man. And that might be the more famous book. Um, that's more of a you know, concise popular thing that he wrote for, for, for English speaking audience. But his main uh, idea of philosophical idea is this thing of the symbolic forms. And I want to just explain uh, what the symbolic forms are and how it is they actually relate to this, this question of culture. So um, his, I think Kassira's position of symbolic forms, you can understand it as a kind of what I would call a symbolic idealism. And what is the symbolic idealism? So, and we can understand symbolic idealism in relation to, 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 to his um, Kantianism or New Kantianism. So, as a New Kantian, Kassira's symbolic idealism can also be understood as related to Kant's transcendental idealism. Uh, but Kassira differs from the Kantian position in the sense that his symbolic idealism, um, different from transcendental idealism, were not merely bound by the a priori conditions of human experience. Um, as it would be for Kant. So, you know, we, we, our experience isn't just bound by space, time, the categories, the schemata, transcendental subject, subjectivity, but also by a symbolic system. And what is this symbolic system? This symbolic system is, is the symbolic forms. Um, in order to, for the human being to experience reality, they need to form, so they need to produce, understand, and partake of what the so-called symbolic forms. And then what are symbolic forms? Well, the symbolic forms are the forms of culture and um, most on the most basic level, something like language or art or religion, myth and science, et cetera, because uh, the symbolic forms are not limited to these. These are just the ones that Kassira had time to write about. Okay. And then, um, okay, so I briefly ex explained what the symbolic forms or culture is on the, on the, the kind of Kassira, Kassira conception. And I want to move to uh, what I what I mean by culture in the in the Chinese context, and I'm really focusing on the word when. Uh, there's a when is a very very ubiquitous term in the in the Chinese tradition and in Chinese culture. Um, it forms um, it kind of cognates with many many different things. So, for example, 文字 
is uh, the the word the individual the individual word. Wenxue is literature. Wenhua means um, culture. Wenming means civilization. Wenren is a person or culture, a civilized person, and many 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 different more things. Um, is incredibly ubiquitous and pervasive, um, and its pervasiveness kind of sits there, so therefore suggests to me that it's like very, very much core valued, a core aspect of Chinese um, worldview and the really, really cherished aspect of Chinese worldview. And I've summarized about six ways in which we can see the word being used in the, in the classical texts, and it's very, very interesting. Um, and I think you'll be surprised. So there's six different ways broadly in which when is used in the Chinese classics. First of all, as a naturally occurring pattern. So all things of the natural world have when. So for example, you have a tree and then the growth rings, you know, that it, if you cut the tree, then it has the rings in the tree, that's when. Um, or the, 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 the patterning on, this, on the snake, we have in the classics, fu uh, shi duo wen. Uh, you know, the, the, the snake has many different wen. The shape of the land has many different wen. Any kind of patterning is wen, natural patterning. So, and then also we, we also refer to wen as the human creation of patterns too. So, you know, like everything in the world has patterns. Obviously human beings are gonna have also have, have patterns. But then it also means something more specifically human. It means the civil and cultural qualities denotative of civilized of sophisticated civilization. So it means it's the marker of civilization in general. And then four, which, so the fourth definition encompasses the first, second, and third definition. It's the outward form to an inner substance. The, in, in the idea of when is some, it's, it's a patterning which directly manifests the, kind of the inner disposition of a thing. Um, it's a kind of outward communicative form. Uh, and then, so, and then number five, in the, it's, it's, we have a more normative sense of when, it means the sense of correct moral form or model or model human conduct, you know, so like a norm, normative moral sense to when as well. And then lastly, in the sense of elegant, correct form in language, or it means a sophisticated literary language. So what I think is interesting about when is the very, this very fact that it crosses this continuum between the natural and the human. And so if I was gonna give a definition of when, which I do in my project, um, uh, a definition that encompasses all the above senses of when will be the self-presencing of a material patterning that, patterning that manifests order. Then when is a manifested pattern that conveys internal dispositions and is applicable to both the natural and the human realms. Okay, so um, interestingly, Derrida actually was very, also remarked upon this, um, both natural and human aspect of when, and he talks about this in on grammatology. Um, but I got this quote from David Abrams, the spell of the centuries, because he was also interested in this. So let me read that out to you. So uh, Derrida says, the word when signifies a conglomeration of marks, the simple symbol in writing. It applies to the veins in stones and wood, to constellations represented by the strokes connecting the stars, to the tracks of birds and the quadrupedes on the ground. Uh, to tattoos, and even, for example, to the designs that decorate the turtle shell. The term when has designated by extension literature. So when is this, you know, it's a term that uh, encompasses this moral, this uh, natural human, human um, continuum. Okay. So, okay, now I want to say why, so I've introduced what um, the, the culture means for Kassira, so that's the symbolic forms, and now I've kind of introduce what culture means for um, the Chinese tradition and Confucian or Confucians. And I've uh, explained about this concept of when. So now I want to go say why it is I wanted to even look at this fact of culture to begin with. Why did I want to defend, def make a philosophical defense of culture? So here, here it is, here, here it is. Um, so what I want to offer is a way of thinking about human beings that emphasizes the agency to create different cultures, um, which then, become to a large degree constitutive of their identities. So for Kassira, man is that animal whose nature is culture. He has a very famous definition that the, um, that the human being is not a rational animal, but a symbolic animal. And he means that in the sense that the human being, um, right, so let me 
put it this way. So for all natural beings, we need an environment in order to flourish. So for example, a fish needs uh, water in order to, to survive, to flourish, you know, it needs the right kind of environment. But we are distinct and unique among all animals um, in the sense that we need to create our own environment in order to thrive. So, you know, a child, if it's not ex exposed to a language by a certain age, their cognitive powers will not develop properly. Like the, the, the growth will just be completely sundered. Their brain won't grow properly. And it's in that sense that uh, we are a symbolic animal because we are that animal in which we need a particular environment or nature, which is culture. Um, you know, and it's not limited to language. We need we need um, language, art, many many other kind of um, cultural environments, and then this environment is this culture is to some extent created by us, which I go on to explain. So, okay, so I, I want to think about the human being in, in that in that kind of term, and well, because I think there is a kind of pressing contemporary need to think about culture, especially culture under this kind of Assyrian Confucian mode that I described. So, and this context of thinking about a philosophical defense of culture is the colonial world order that was so disastrously unable to accept the plurality of cultural orders and then the legitimate sovereignty and agency of human beings to create their own cultural forms. Through its discovery of the American continent, Europe encountered previously unimagined diversity because obviously Columbus thought he was going to encounter Asia and they already had, they already had encompassed Asia in their own imaginative frameworks, but they met something that they never even thought about. But then that, you know, that confrontation was, was catastrophic. This confrontation with diversity, it was this confrontation with diversity that precipitated the first formulations of international law on the basis of which the American Indians were robbed of their sovereignty. And I think this, still, this very troubled first encounter with, with cultural diversity has actually left quite a lasting legacy. I think mainstream academic philosophy in the, uh, what I've called the Francesco de Vittoria mode. Francesco de Vittoria was a, a scholastic from the School of Salamanca in, in Spain, who was um, seen as the first father of international law. So mainstream academic philosophy in this medieval mode, I think, still assumes the fact of universalism and is worryingly insensitive to the empir empirical existence of diversity. For, for mainstream academic philosophy, culture is irrelevant to philosophy. Um, you know, when I was doing research for this book, I found one contemporary book um, by American pragmatist on, 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 on culture and then I didn't find anything else. And then, so, you know, culture is irrelevant to philosophy, just as the existence of cultural difference was of no consequence to, for the Spaniards version of universalism. What cultural difference that exists as past is either non-essential or, de or deviant and so of no consequence to a putative essential saintness. Cultural diversity is not real. Only saintness is real. And so this inability to dignify cultural difference has led to the more worrying historical phenomenon of passing difference in racial terms. So there's a lot of um, uh, scientists and from the early days of biology that you know saw very real difference among people but there's a lot of those differences are cultural but then they, they kind of saw those cultural differences in ontological terms you know and therefore saw it in kind of these racial terms so that um yeah so so due to this you know i'm thinking this context this history is kind of a context due to this history i think mainstream academic philosophy uses i currently uses currently utilizes impoverished resources for understanding difference or pluralism. So, you know, this part of the motivation of this book is to contribute to a better way of thinking about our sameness and differences. Okay, so now I get to that point where I want to, I need to um, define what I uh, mean by culture under this Confucian Caesarea sense. And um, okay, so, so key to both Confucianism and Kassira's uh, humanism, I would say, is this creation of a form. It's a human creation of a form, the cultural form. And what I mean by form is actually um, maybe quite counterintuitive. What I mean by form is actually a dynamic functional system for organizing experience, which is not uh, derived from or modeled on a transcendent source, but instead constructed by humans in coherence with their natural and social milieus. And so in the, in the, um, in the Kassira, 
context, it would be the symbolic forms. And the Chinese context, we have one. But then also, very importantly, another term, which is xiang, which is in, in the Book of Changes, which I, well, I focus on a lot in my project, and which I will go on to explain very briefly. Xiang is perhaps the most important term in the Book of Changes. Um, and so I will explain that in my next slide. And it has a, a very interesting relationship to one. So um, I think this Confucian Cassirian conception of culture allocates a human being a position among the myriad things of the world that allows for both commensurability and uniqueness. We are continuous with all other living things in that we seek to express ourselves, but we are unique among all, li all living things in that we have an especially sophisticated language. And you can see that in the, um, the ways that when is uh, defined in the, in the Chinese classics. Okay, so now I want to talk about that term xiang. Like I said, that, uh, that term xiang that I mentioned just now. Uh, so in some ways, my whole project, and I'll give you, a very, give you a summary of it after this slide. My whole project in some ways is um, anchored around a particular interpretation of one key passage from the Book of Changes. So the Book of Changes, as we all know, is, um, is the mother of all books. <laughs> I heard it in a film somewhere, an American film somewhere. It's the mother of all, of all books. Um, so it, it started life out as a divination manual very, very early on, but then it only achieved its canonical status when it had these uh, so-called 10 wings, which is a, a set of 10 commentaries added to this original divination manual. And the 10 sets of commentaries really made explicit a lot of the worldviews, philosophical worldviews that were implicit in the way that the hexagrams change and the, 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 the way that um, the hexagrams explain worldly situations, etc. cetera. Um, so this, this set of 10 wings that were added uh, really made this text into a philosophical text, whereas previously it was, you know, seen as a, um, a text from kind of um, divination. And uh, legend has it that the Ten Wings were added by Confucius, but modern scholarship disputes that fact. Um, but it's really the, we can think of the Ten Wings as what made, what gave um, the Book of Changes the canonical status that it enjoys. It's not really the, the divination aspect, the previous layers. And um, the two most important aspects of the Ten Commentaries are a two-part commentary called the Great, uh, the Great Commentary, um, which is called the Sits in, in Chinese. So the passage that I have focused on is from um, the latter, latter part of the Sits and um, section two. So for, for brevity's sake, I've called it Sits 2.2. And what is fascinating, absolutely fascinating about this section, about this passage is that it uh, describes how the sages created civilization because civilization was seen as um, indebted to the creation of the of the trigrams or hexagrams and um, um, and then so and then and then also the trigrams the hexagrams are also identified with with writing so this passage in brief explains how it is that the sage created the trigrams which were able to kind of predict things uh, you know so massively powerful so this passage explains how does the sage created the trigrams, how they created the, the in instruments of civilization, the, instru the instruments that symbolize civilization, such as burial rites or houses or boats or, um, uh, and then ultimately writing. So he made eight kind of creations which symbolize civilization. So this passage explains to us how it is the sage created the trigram, how they basically created civilization and how they created, you know, and among those things, how they created writing. Um, so intrinsically, that's already fascinating. So internal to this passage itself, it's already fascinating that, oh, how is it that you're inventing suddenly basically creating civilization? But then also external to the text is also fascinating because this text became very, very influential. Um, if you look at the, uh, many, many imp later imperial texts base themselves on this on this uh, particular passage. For example, 
the first etymology dictionary in the Chinese tradition, the Shuo Wen Jiezi, it has a post face which tries to explain how it is that human beings now have writing. And then they model, the, the writer models, its, models this genesis of how writing came to be exactly on this passage. It's basically the same thing. Um, and, then, and then there's many, many other different examples of how this, this text later it was just the model for, for Chinese thinking about the origins of, of civilization and um, literature writing. So, um, so let me just read it and then I'll tell you why I think this is fascinating. So when in ancient times, Lord Balsi, he was a um, civilizational hero in China, when in ancient times Lord Balsi ruled the world as sovereign, he looked upward and observed images, so that word xiang, um, in heaven, and looked downward and observed the models that the earth provided. He observed the patterns on, so that's the word wind, patterns on birds and beasts and what things were suitable for the land, nearby adopting them from his own from his own person and afar adopting them from other things, he thereupon made the eight trigrams in order to become thoroughly conversant with the virtues inherent in the numinous and the bright and to classify the myriad things in terms of their true natures, their qing. And then the, the, the text goes on to list the eight inventions um, that, he, that he made. But the, so the first one he made was he tied cords together and made various kinds of snare nets for catching animals and fish. He probably got the idea for, for this from the hexagram Lee cohesion. And then it goes on to list eight different things. And then ultimately he was inspired by the hexagram by another hexagram to invent invent writing. Um, okay, so so what, what, as I interpret it, what's going on in this text is this: back in back way back in the midst of time, we had this really really amazing person who looked who looked everywhere. He looked up. He looked down. He looked everywhere. He looked towards his own person. He, he comprehensively observed all the things in the world. But then in order to fully completely understand these things, um, he thereupon made the eight trigrams in order to be thoroughly conversant with, with, with the nature of things. So, you know, first of all, he really observed everything, but then he had to make these trigrams in order to then become fully conversant with the things that he was already observing. So it seems to me that this isn't a rep, um, and, okay. Let me go on. So, um, and then once he has made these trigrams, he was able to look at these trigrams uh, and then invent the institutions of civilization, basically invent human civilization. Uh, so it, it seems to so it seems to me that this isn't uh, this is very different from a kind of representationalist account of of meaning, uh, which is actually a more kind of dominant under interpretation of this passage. You know, if it was just a representational understanding of meaning, he would just look at patterns of the world and then make and then make the instruments of civilization. You wouldn't need to make these, these trigrams. The trigrams are obviously as a, me, as a medial step is doing something that he would that the sage wouldn't be able to do if he didn't have these trigrams. Um, so, you know, and that's why I think this passage is interesting in relation to Kassira's symbolic idealism. And I'll now go on to explain more about what I mean by going through the summary of my chapters for the remainder of my talk. Okay, so um, in the first, I have an introduction which I haven't talked about, but then in the first chapter, I also I lay out um, the six characteristics of Kassira's philosophy, as well as his interpretation of intellectual history. It is these six characteristics that, were, that lead to a valorization of this humanly created symbol. These six characteristics, as will be shown throughout the following chapters, is shared by Confucian philosophy. So this, um, this obviously there are dominant themes within Kassira's philosophy, and I pick up these kind of dominant themes. And he's, Kassir is also a very, very famous intellectual historian, very competent. And he tends to interpret intellectual history, European intellectual history as progressing towards his own position. Uh, so he tends to like kind of make, say, oh, history is kind of progressing towards these kind of six characteristics because, you know, because I'm right. And, um, and so, you know, I also show how he interprets in European intellectual history as progressing towards 
these kind of six characteristics, which is the foundation for his philosophy of symbolic forms. And then the second chapter, um, uh, Li Xiang Yi Jing Yi, giving symbolic form to phenomena. So Li Xiang Yi Jing Yi is like uh, establishing um, symbols in order to exhaust meaning. That's a passage I've picked out from them, from the Xi Zi. Um, so this chapter will introduce the idea that for the Confucians, the world is fundamentally expressive to people. Everything has this kind of tendency towards expression. Put differently, the nature or the king, or the king of the world tends towards manifestation and patterns. The human creation of the, <laughs> the human creation of the sign is a but then but then the human creation of the sign is a creative consummation of the nature of things. What was happening in that particular passage that I explained? You no, know, the world is always meaningful in some sense. You know, phenomenologically meaningful. It's meaningful to the sage, but then the sage had to kind of creatively consummate that symbol, uh, consummate the nature of things in a in, in some kind of kind of human creation of a sign. And then this Kassirian counterpart to this expressiveness of the world is this theory of symbolic pregnancy, which is um, a term that actually Merleau Ponty borrows, and he talks about it in um, phenomenology of perception. The world is always phenomenologically meaningful. For Kassira, as for the Confucians, it's only once we stabilize the symbolic pregnancy in a symbol, however, that the human can attain to higher levels of meaning and, and thus achieve civilization. Um, so I've talked about the importance of language, for example, for, for child development. Kassira uh, gives this kind of negative proof of why symbols are important for human beings. And he, he talks about um, people with mental conditions who actually lose their symbolic, symbolic capacities. So for example, aphasia, you know, aphasia and such. And then their ability to understand the world is just is very, very, very different to, to like a, somebody who has this kind of symbolic consciousness. Um, so he tries to prove the importance of the, what he calls symbols for, for just human ability to engage with the world. Okay, so continuing with that, um, chapter three, Shi Yan Zhi, giving poetic form to Qing. Um, this, I show how this particular paradigm of the human relationship to the world and then also the relationship of the, of the cultural form, you can see that in the, in in, uh, in Chinese, in Confucian attitudes to poetry as well. So Shi Yan Zhi is the term picked, taken from the preface to the Book of Odes. So chapter three will show how this paradigm of sign creation also applies to Confucian poetics. The self under the Confucian view is both inherently emotional. You're, the self has qing, you know, it's just, it has this just kind of dispositions and then the, the self needs to manifest these emotions. Poetry and music are, are thus this kind of creative consummation of the of the qing, the disposition and the kind of inherent pattern that the self um, had and in the same way that the sign was a con creative consummation of the qing of the world. The form of poetry however can only arise in a social context. For Kassira, art is this kind of golden, golden mean between the emotionality or sensuousness of myth as a poetic form and then the abstraction of religion as a poetic form. Art is thus able to affirm our emotional, emotional nature without merely languishing in or making us a slave of the emotions. And this is art's contribution to humanity. And I think the similarities that underlie Confucianism, Confucianism as well, the, the kind of um, the role that the arts, uh, music and poetry have for, for contributing to social harmony. Um, okay. So fourth chapter, I. Uh, I, when you say doll, which is the, the calligraphy on my, uh, on my book cover, I show how this paradigm of culture as creative consummation is equally found in preaching and Han theories of the origins of writing and literature. So again, humans manifest their own patterns appropriate to themselves, just as the myriad things in the phenomenal world manifest their own patterns. This chapter will also show that the, this, um, uh, what, this mutually participatory relationship between man and cosmos that underlies xiang. So I think there's this kind of tian he idea that underlies the, that symbol, the xiang. This idea can also be found in terms such as wen and li, two other key terms associated with meaning and representation, the same kind of paradigms that I talked about, the relationship between the self and the world um, can also be found in these other very, very key terms. 
And then lastly, I apply, not lastly, penultimately, I apply um, the, the, what I've talked about to the Confucian and Kassirian understanding of subjectivity. So is a term um, from the Analects. So this chapter will show that because as shown in the previous chapters, external manifestation of an inner nature is inherent to the nature of all things, the when of human beings creatively consummate the self um, and, oh, sorry, and the when of human beings creatively consummate the self, culture becomes necessary for the fulfillment of the self. So we need culture. The understanding, this understanding of subjectivity is termed a functional self in the, sen in the, se in the sense that the self is like a mathematical function that is dependent on the factor of culture. So in the sense that like a function depends on the mathematical series for its existence. The self and the factor of culture become mutually dependent and determinative. The Cassirian understanding of subjectivity like Confucianism is similarly functional. The self is its potential to take on and creatively partake of culture. There's no essence to the self apart from its manifestation in, in culture, or the essence of the self is its tendency to, to manifest itself in and to creatively partake of culture. Okay. So lastly, um, I offer some, in my final chapter, I offer some metaphilosophical and history of philosophy reflections on how, why it is that um, there, there tends to, that I've discovered so many of these kind of what I think are similarities between the Confucian, Confucian and Cassirian position. And I think it has to do with the rise of organic thinking in the, in the German philosophy in the post-Kantian period, this, the rise of biology. And then really the, the pervasiveness of thinking about nature and the, the organic among not just um, German idealists or romantic philosophers, but just among scientists in general. So chapter six will pick up the discussion of pluralism outlined in chapter one. It is because the myriad things have a latent order within them, which and which they necessarily manifest, that order is thus not imposed eternally, externally. Everything is spontaneously having its own patterns. Each thing manifests its own pattern or order. And so there is a pluralism of different orders. Acknowledging this pluralism, however, did not pose the intellectual threat of chaos to the Confucians. For the Confucians, the organic world is, is paradigmatic of harmony among diversity. Um, so there's a famous line from the doctrine of the Ming, Dao Bing Sing, Er Bu Xiang Bei, the myriad dolls travel with each, uh, with each other, but they do not harm each other. So that they really, just, I think they really did think that there's some, some way that um, there can be plurality. And then, you know, so this pluralism, how it did not pose the intellectual threat of chaos to the Confucians. For the Confucians, the organic world, which is I think what they're basing the ideas of diversity on, the, for the Confucians, the organic world is paradigmatic of harmony among diversity. If each thing manifests its own order, then there are infinite orders in nature, but nature is harmonious. The flourishing of each individuality on its own terms need not impede the coherence of the whole. It is this paradigm what I, of what I have termed organic harmony, on which Confucianism modeled its own thinking about harmony and contrariety. Um, like Confucianism, Kassira was also very serious about there being a plurality of orders, a harmony contrariety, which is a term he uses in an essay on man, a harmony of a harmony contrariety among the symbolic forms. So he wants there to be to be coherence among the symbolic forms. For Kassira, the first historical figure who was able to reconcile individualism without conceding to the chaos of the whole and so spearhead a paradigm shift was Leibniz. Leibniz's monadology in Kassiri's eyes came to have a profound influence on subsequent German thought. The stress on holism, becoming, and perspectivism, perspectivism found in the thought of Goethe's natural science, Wilhelm von Humboldt's philosophy of language, and Herder's uh, views on history and cosmopolitanism are all indebted to the philosophy of the organic initiated by Leibniz. The monadology's resemblance to Chinese organic thinking will be pointed to, and thus a key reason for the similarity between Kassira's thought and Confucian philosophy gestured toward. Okay, so that's basically it. So I'll basically, I'll stop there and I just uh, uh, briefly say that, you know, all this, that stuff, I'm not, it's not just like, I stopped working on it in, with my first book. I continue to think about, um, you know, these themes that I, you know, thought about in my in my first project. Now, you know, I've done, I'm continuing to do more work on cosmopolitanism and pluralism. I actually recently did quite a lot of work on this 
what I call the cultural concept of self versus the racial concept of self. And then finally, I also want to recently really want to articulate this, this last chapter that I've been working on this idea. I really think that this, the idea of the organic and um, uh, and is, is very, very foundational to Chinese metaphysics. And I wanted to articulate this um, Chinese metaphysics as this kind of metaphysics of life. So, um, so, that's, that, so that's it. Uh, thank you so much for, for listening. Um, so uh, yeah, so thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is wonderful and it's uh, right on time. Um, so, um, uh, I, I put this in the chat room. If you want to raise question, you can put your name in the chat room so we can have a, uh, some sort of queue. Uh, or if there, if it's not super busy, people can can also just uh, unmute yourself. So right now we have Adam uh, who who like to raise a question. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, uh, Professor Chang. That was really incredible. Thank you so much. Um, so my question: I've only read Language and Myth by Kasir. Uh, um, but it, I read it years ago and it totally blew me away. Um, and so when, I, when I'm hearing you talk about this, I'm, I'm kind of filtering it all through that. But um, so my takeaway from, from that work was that uh, language and myth uh, and myth being kind of like our, our cultural founding ideas and like the things that shape culture. It, my takeaway from what I thought Kasir was saying was that language and myth both kind of come from the same place, this kind of nebulous pre-thought space. And there, there are two different ways that we make meaning and kind of uh, give shape to kind of the world around us in like a, a physical and abstract sense. And so, and it may have not been what he was saying, it's what I got from it. But if, if that is what he's saying, uh, is your idea of form, does it kind of play with that idea? And does when uh, kind of um, come in at the level of language or would it come at the level of myth or is it like an uh like an interpenetration of those ideas that are like in concert with each other if that mm. question makes sense yeah yeah no i think that's like a, a question i think people always ask of kasir what is exactly the relationship between the symbolic forms because um i well, he explicitly says that there is no hierarchy among the symbolic forms so it's not like uh, myth is a lower form than language, but the way when he writes things, it gives it a very different impression because his first book is uh, his first volume is on language. So there is a sense that uh, language is the first symbolic form. Um, but then he also, when he writes, comes to write about myth, he also gives these ideas that uh, other symbolic forms are built off of myth because myth is the first, most emotional, sensuous um, of all, all the symbolic forms. It, it, in the mythic world, people live their emotions. They don't, you know, so, um, so the, he, he does often give this impression that myth is somehow um, either the logically foremost or temporally for first symbolic form. And it's, it's not, I don't think it's completely cl clear uh, how he means, but he, he, but then, but then again, he had, and really, really rejects this kind of Hegelian hierarchy of, of, of the kind of progress of spirit. So it's, um, so I think maybe there's a tension within his own work about the relationship between those, between those forms. Yeah, I don't, if does that answer the question? Yeah, and I was also, well, that, that definitely clarifies uh, his, his take on it somewhat for me, so thank you. And I was also curious, like, in, in your work, are you, are, are you taking a similar stance where, like, when, and then, I don't know where his idea of, like, Geist comes in for you, or, like, where you're, like, um, yeah, that in, but, like, what is, is there a similar tension, or does one idea more significantly inform the other, or, like, expand the other? No, I, um, so I'm, um, for me, it's more, the more important part of his work is his kind of stress on this, uh, um, what he calls the harmony and contrariety among the symbolic forms. So, um, so, so he, so in that, that, uh, that quote, harmony and contrariety comes from the an essay on man, and he's talking about 
and he was actually very troubled by the rise of um, kind of more reductive sciences that tend to reduce human culture to to, 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 to just behaviorism. Um, and so he, so when he was talking about harmony and contrariety, he was very much trying to um, uh, prevent one any one symbolic form from reduced to to another. Um, and he, <clears throat> so so at different times, I guess in different times of the career, he kind of emphasizes different things. And for me, I'm personally interested in in in, in the times when he tries to really defend the um, <clears throat> defend any one symbolic form from being reduced to another. And he also says that uh, symbolic forms tend to be very jealous. They, they want to become dominant, but then it's, um, okay, so if I actually, maybe I talk a bit this, that take a little bit longer to, to explain this point. He actually, <clears throat> so towards the end of his life, he actually became very, he wrote a lot of moral and political philosophy, especially in like in the myth of the state. And I have a paper about this um, where I say that, uh, so Kassira, his argument <laughs> against against um, Nazism wasn't he he it's all it's so striking very interesting that he thought that myth became dominant as a symbolic form, but he, but then he but then he emphasizes that you you know myth is an inalienable aspect of human existence. It's not like you can just get rid get rid of myth. If you get rid of myth, you get rid of everything because he also says you know all other human symbolic forms are built on myth so it's not the way to deal with it isn't just to get rid of myth that's impossible you know that's like suicide but then so he emphasizes he, the words he uses are equilibrium harmony so this idea that you have that everything has to be kind of uh, has to be basically it has to be plurality of symbolic forms for there to be a healthy human ecosystem for humans to flourish thank you Okay, thank you. Uh, so, Shu Cheng, maybe you can uh, stop sharing the screen, so then uh, we can we can see more people on the um, on in one screen. That usually makes it uh, better. So, okay, thank you. Uh, next one, TK Chu. Uh, thank you, and thank you, uh, Professor Xiang. Really inspiring talk. I have a two part of a question, but if the first part is no, then you don't have to answer the second part. Um, first part is related to your summary, chapter summary on chapter two. And I only wrote down the Chinese part. Is it Li Xiang Yi Jing Yi? Okay, now here's the Xiang. Does this one Xiang here includes the Wenzi, namely the written language itself? And if it does not, then you don't can forget about it or my second part. And if it does, then presumably we will not find a counterpart in Kassiri. And how do you account for this unique part of the Chinese culture, which has no counterparts anywhere else? How do they show in this comparison of culture that in your thesis? Uh, so I, I think I, <clears throat> um, I think you might have to um, repeat part two again for me, but maybe I can try to explain, uh, try to um, answer part one first, and then maybe you can uh, repeat part two for me. I think I, I think <laughs> I started thinking about the answers of part one, and I didn't really quite follow the question on part two. Um, Should I say it again? Did you, was my under question understood? Part one, yes. Uh, you might have to repeat part two in a bit. So I'm not, uh, just off of my head, I'm not, I, I've forgotten exactly where uh, this Li Xiang Yi Jing comes. It's from, it's from the seeds of like, which passage exactly and what the context was, I, I can't remember. So I don't, I don't, I couldn't tell you, it's just straight off uh, if it includes the, um, <clears throat> Includes when in in there, but I don't. But uh, in general, I don't. My 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 thesis would be no that uh, Xiang when well when obviously means different things. Um, when in the sense of just like natural patterning, but in the sense of wen zi, as uh, in terms of Xiang is a wen zi. Xiang, especially when you talk about the Xiang, I mean that bring in the written part into the, the topic. 
But if you say it does not include, that's all right. Yeah, so so uh, when when I use this, but I meant Xiang in terms of um, the the hexagrams, because the, 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 the Xiang means many different things in the in the seed. So sometimes, you know, in the passage I, I cited, it just means you know the stars in the sky. It just means patterns. It means like obs observational kind of naturally occurring patterns. But but then it, sometimes it also means specifically the trigrams. But then sometimes it also means the images that are of in the in the hexagrams themselves. So for example, Quin, you know, or uh, also, it means the naturally occurring situation, philosophical situation, like Tian, you know, it means like a particular kind of imagistic philosophy. So it means that um, but my general sense is that uh, right when in, the, when in the sense of writing is derived from, um, uh, from this, from the trigrams, because that was explicit in that passage that I that I looked at. So I kind of put kind of a bit more sort of focus on on that um, aspect. Thank you. I don't but and then there was a part two which I didn't really under. Uh, Warren. Are we ready to go forward from that? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Professor Chang, uh, lovely talk. Um, and uh, I thought I was particularly taken by the focus at the end on the, the importance of um, organ, organic thinking, as you call it. I call it organismic. Um, there's a sort of an organ, organismic ontology that's functioning in the Confucian tradition that I think gets underappreciated. Um, you know, when people try to take those concepts and bring them into into the Western conversations. Um, and along those lines, <clears throat> I'll get to a question in just one second, but there was so much in there that I'm, um, um, I'm interested in. Um, along those lines, uh, you have natural conversation partners um, outside of those philosophic traditions that you've listed. The obvious example would be um, the, the process tradition in the West, you know, uh, Whitehead, and those descendants, and then you did mention you found a you know a um, um, a a book written by a pragmatist on culture. I mean, Peirce, James, and especially Dewey, the organismic understanding. It's just all throughout the whole thing. So these are your people. <laughs> if you and and Whitehead had a particular appreciation for Casir. So um, uh, there's not a, it's not a leap uh, for you going forward. But now to the question, I'm, I'm sort of interested in, in um, why as you develop this, my natural instinct would have been to match Kassir's understanding of the symbolic forms with Confucian understanding of ritual. Um, that's sort of where I would have gone. And I'm, I'm just curious to hear you talk about um, either why that might make sense to you in some ways or why you thought about it, but went in a different direction. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, do you and why? Yeah, um, I kind of didn't go the do because so many people, I think a lot of people already um, kind, of know, kind of know that connection. And then also, I think actually Dewey was, am I right that he was in, I think he was probably a Hegelian earlier on. So I think, I think that's maybe where the kind of organic kind of thinking arrives, to how it arrives to the sort of American shores. Mm -hmm. um, with Whitehead, I don't know how, where that kind of organic stuff kind of comes from, but Kassir actually, I think in footnotes, uh, speaks appro very approvingly of, of Whitehead as well. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that's something that I definitely need to kind of read more uh, to, yeah. Um, and so with ritual, um, yeah, the ritual, again, it was just because I think a lot of people work on it already. Um, so I think so. I think it was Holland Ames who first talked about it as a cultural grammar, ritual as a cultural grammar. And then um, I think Dr. Li Chen, Li Chen Yang, he also wrote quite a lot about um, uh, ritual as a cultural grammar, which I all completely agree with. And so it just seemed to me that, uh, you know, that was already quite well explored and well, while these other aspects that I wrote about were not as much explored. And then also because, um, uh, well, I 
also just because because Sirat doesn't really talk about it. But he, you know, he he's much more, um, you know, he he hasn't he, he hasn't really. So it was harder to kind of kind of make it converge in that sense, just for kind of aesthetic reasons. Harder to kind of make it converge. But, so those kind of two were the large reasons um, why I didn't go there. But I definitely do think that it's um, you know, it's I probably yeah I probably should have or something. <laughs> Because it's, I think it's right. Um, so before we go to the next one, uh, can I ex exercise a interrogatory um, and and ask a question? Um, it's 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 a it's a it's an I hope it's a simple question. So what exactly is the role of Casera in the in in the project, right? What do you um, what what if you just do Confucianism? What will be lost in 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 the project? Sort of, it's you know, is 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 this an explicitly comparative, or is it, or are you using Casera as a kind of a template in some ways to, at the kind of a midwife to to, uh, yeah. to channel Confucian, you know, or e or Eugene? Does the, does the question make sense? Yeah, it does. Um, I think both. I think it it acts as a kind of template because I can you know talk about Confucianism in this in this particular language that um, makes. That has a bit because obviously Kasira he has a story to him. He's he's a figure of a particular lineage, and he there's a very clear path of development that you can see through intellectual history to see to see how why he how he take how he improves on uh, not improves on he takes on Kantianism, how he takes on Goethe because he's massively influenced by Goethe. How he take he's influenced by people like uh, von hum Wilhelm von Humboldt, the philosophies of language that were being written at that time. So it's a very clear line. So it's, he's useful because there's a very clear line of descent, and you can you can just see where the strands are coming in that make him who he is in intellectual in European intellectual history. And so, um, and I wanted to articulate Confucianism. You know, so using him, it's easy to to kind of show, in some ways, show to place Confucianism. According to even though the back of the historical background obviously is European, it's not Chinese, but then the, you know it's another way of making sense of what Confucianism is. You know how did how did Kassira arrive at the position that he did? You know that that kind of you know if you can bring it over to to Confucianism, you know you see all the issues that the the Kantians are trying to deal with, the post Kantians are trying to deal with, and then they're somehow resolved in a particular way in, in Kassira. Because a large part of my project that I actually emphasize is this turn, this idea of Tian who are you, this trying to um, overcome this kind of dualism, which is just obviously like probably the main thing that the the post Kantians are trying to wrestle with. And I was just trying to say that look, you can also think about Confucianism as even though they weren't obviously they weren't you know they were ever having to deal with the post Kantian heritage, but really like the. the it's resolved in some ways in Confucianism in a very similar way that the post Kantians did, but, but you know, but without this, uh, yeah. So, so it's just a lot of the themes that um, were exercising this particular tradition. You can also see it clearly um, resolved in a particular way in the Confucian tradition. Um, uh, okay, so I'm gonna kind of I think I'm just. Um, uh, rabbling on a bit, um, right? Yeah, you know yeah, that it's it's actually really interesting because it's you know it it, it sounds like the, uh, the the way that you describe portray Kasura, it seems to be the that's the you know based upon the the kind of different kind of trajectory and uh, whereas in the case of Confucianism, um, that's the very beginning, right? That's you know yeah, it, it yeah. The, so they almost like their their trajectory is very very different, and yeah. so they, so they, the the kind of uh, historical route, the, the kind of the way that that they work out the problems, and and the, in some in some sense, the uh, you know the, the Confucian problem, Confucians were not dealing quite with the same set of problem, even though they might have arrived at a similar kind of place. Does that make sense? In, in, in that? Yes, and I think it, that is kind of what I think because the what I want to really emphasized in this project was Confucian humanism, which is another reason why I wanted to do Kassira because you know this is so humanistic with culture and stuff. And I just wanted to emphasize this humanistic spirit of Confucianism. And it's hard to explain. It sounds like such such a kind of empty thing. Oh, it's humanistic. It's Tian Hu Yi. 
you know, you say tear and you just think that you just sound this idealistic thing. But then if you place it in the context of the problems that, you know, another tradition, which was, you know, they, I don't, I think the Western tradition, because it was religious to, from the beginning, like it was for Kassira, it was actually kind of very, becomes much more secular. And then you have much more of this kind of organic metaphysics, this kind of tendency towards the humanism. So it's, so it's actually, it's exactly like you said, it's, um, I wanted to, yes, they, they can't arrive at the same place, but then the why they arrive kind of be, be, betrays a lot of um, these kind of philosophical assumptions, previous assumptions and how they changed. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. That's, that's great. Um, so next one, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, are you there? Uh, okay, so so let, let's let's go with Ken. Ken, we'll come back to Elizabeth. Ken. Hello, thank you so much for that talk. So yeah. um, I have a question also about ritual, but maybe I can frame it in a different way that Warren posed. And so, coming from religious studies. When I hear symbolic form, I immediately think of Clifford Goethe's anthropology and how he defines religion as a system of symbols. And that leads me to think of uh, Talal Assad's critique of Goethe, that Goethe is too focused on the theory and kind of mental beliefs and less about action and praxis. And so my question for you is, is there um, something in Coursera's philosophy that um, might be have, might be an analog to Confucian ritual because if you read Confucian texts, it's clear that there's praxis involved. And if there is an analog, what is it? If there isn't an analog, is that an issue for your project? Thank you. Um, that's a really yeah, that's a, a great question. I think it's related to um, the Warren Dr. Warren Frisner's question. Um, um, I don't think there is an analog in Kassira for, for, for Confucian ritual. Uh, he's, I think he's much more kind of, I don't know how you call it, Kantian in that, you know, he, that his, he's still quite, he's kind of old school in that. And if I say old school, I don't know, you know, he's much, he's, he's epistem, you know, he, he thinks he, he's a philosopher. He's always, is to do with epistemology. Um, <clears throat> so I don't think there is an analog. Um, the, 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 the most that there is in Kassira, um is that he, I, I don't think he, obviously he's not a mind-body dualist or anything. So, so that's the, the most that it would approximate to. Um, yeah, so, so I said basically, no, I don't think there is an analog. And yeah, and if I think, I guess in now, if we were gonna rewrite Kassiris philosophy of symbolic forms um, in the 21st century, then yes, I think that's something we have to consider this, uh, especially because we're talking about, you know, relation to Confucianism and the very, very meaningful way of engaging with the world, with others through ritual. That is, yes, I think that would be something that Kassir would, if he was still around, we'd have to um, get into, you know, to to think about, and or maybe I, I should have thought about. <laughs> Thank you, um, Elizabeth. You want to raise your question? Uh, you need, you're unmuted. You're muted. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Here I am. I have no idea what it is, but my husband, Larry Miller, would like to ask the question. So oh. I will hand the floor over to him if that's allowed. Here. Hi, I was fascinated by your talk, but I had a question about culture. If uh, Kasira did not believe in any hierarchy, then how could he oh, represent that his philosophy was superior to any other? Or that German culture was superior to we're, we're on. any other culture. Um. I, well, I don't know if he. So, did you, did you say that this is, German culture was superior? I, I don't know if he thought German culture. 
I don't know if well, I heard right. Well, I was, from what you said, I was, it seems as though he's a great proponent of Goethe. I probably knew all of Goethe by heart. He was a product of the German system, of European culture. From what we know of the Germans uh, who were educated in the early 1900s and who were writing uh, scholarly works in the 30s, for example, Werner Jaeger, they were very um, nationalistic and racial in their thinking. And they seem to have inherently supposed that their culture was the best. And yet, um, philosophically, it seems as though Kassir was taking the position that no one culture is better than another. And so I'm trying to understand if he was able actually to criticize Nazism, if that was not just another culture among many. Yeah. So, yeah, thank you. So, um, the, yeah, the specter of, the specter of relativism. Um, but for, for German culture, I think that um, Kassira was actually, he was perhaps more of a European in some ways. So well, I, I derived that conclusion from, he wrote a book in 1916 called Freedom and Form. And he was actually quite worried about the rise of nationalism uh, in, 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 within Europe. And he wrote a book um, uh, talking about the relationship between freedom and form, how form is, is in, what enables us to have freedom. And it was actually intellectual history of uh, European uh, thought from the medieval period onwards. And he thinks of Renaissance as a great watershed. And he emphasized, and he was really, he wrote that book to charge against the rising nationalism in Germany. And he, and he tried to show how um, the Enlightenment and the Renaissance ideas in different parts of Europe um, flourished in different ways, um, and how much how indebted uh, German the German culture is actually to to just Euro, European culture and, and, and Enlightenment ideas as a kind of European wide phenomenon. Um, so I mean, yes, it's true that he quoted Goethe Goethe by heart, and I think that. Um, yes, he, he was a great lover of Goethe. Uh, in terms of the relativism, um, uh, I think, so there's a, there's a charge that's often leveled at Kassira that he doesn't have an ethics because he never explicitly wrote, you know, not like Kant wrote the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, you know, he never wrote, um, a, a treatise is explicitly laying out his ethical positions to the extent that um, that a contemporary Kassira scholars think that Kassira has no ethics. Uh, so I, you know, when I talked about organic harmony and I wrote a paper about Kassira's ethics as a kind of harmony, um, I, do, I do think that his ultimate position is to is to argue argue for for the diver diversity of different symbolic forms but the but the thing is he talked about symbolic forms and the thing is he was he was a he was a european from the you know the late 19th early 20th century he didn't talk about different cultures so you know to some extent i am extrapolating he talked about the importance of having diversity of cultures uh, diversity of symbolic forms you know art language science you know they all had to have their place but he didn't actually you know talk about um different role cultures or anything. So that's, that's me, that's me extrapolating, using, you know, taking on his stuff. So. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question. Okay, so next question is from Teresa Lee. Uh, she wants me to relay the question. So she thinks that there is a, there is a bit of an imbalance in your approach uh, because on the one hand you talk about uh, Kassira, that's one person. On the other hand, you're talking about the Confucian tradition, which is, you know, let's say uh, complex and, uh, and, and, uh, and long and large. So, uh, uh, so she wonders how do you account for this uh, uh, imbalance? Uh, I guess, I don't know, I, think, I guess there is, well, you know, in that sense, there is an imbalance. Um, you know, Confucianism is just a, a whole tradition. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, 
yeah, I think maybe, the, you know, in that sense, yeah, there is, a, it, there is an imbalance. Um, yeah, I don't, yeah, I think, yeah. All right, so so there is an imbalance. <laughs> okay, um, the. Uh... Well, I mean that. Okay, well, in that, I mean, um, but the, you know, the, the different traditions, like you know, Confucianism. They, part, uh, you know, the Confucius doesn't even write, didn't even write down his own his own text. He didn't have I like, same the same ideas about authorship. The, you know, the German tradition has a very, um you know, very different idea of how it is you do philosophy, especially with the with, with post-Kantians, you know, so the tradition to begin with is kind of incommensurable. Um, and because if I, so if I was going to be completely, um, how would you call it, uh, balanced, I take, I only pick one Chinese uh, Confucian, maybe I'll pick Xunzi. I think I use, I use Xunzi quite a lot. I mean, I use the Book of Changes, but uh, you know, the, I, there's so many people who argue that the Sitsu was, was, was written by Taoists. Chengu, you think it's written by Taoists? I don't think, you know, so, so I can't even use that text. Um, you know, so, 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 but, okay, so if, I, if I was in complete balance and I only, could only choose one Confucian from whom it was clearly authored, I would choose Xunzi. Or on the other hand, if I had to use Confucianism and then just a particular tradition, I would just call it the post-Kantian tradition. Uh, po that particular moment in the post-Kantian tradition before German idealism, that tends to get kind of, that gets either called the ghetto light or the romantics. But, you know, so, so okay, actually, I think that maybe that's a good way to put it. Maybe I, I think Confucianism and really I kind of, because I emphasize so much that Kassira is indebted to, to people like Goethe and Herder and then they're really, um, the, this kind of particular Goethe side philosophers is okay. So I changed I changed my book. <laughs> but difference of culture of Confucianism and the Goethe and the Goethe side. But it, it's just a convenience because if you talk about Goethe side, you have to write just, just five books or something. So, but okay, anyway, that's that's really fair. I, you know, I, yeah. So right. I mean, some, um, yeah, sometimes these practical considerations. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. right. So next one, Abel. Oh. Um. Hi, yeah. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I my my question was in a way uh, a follow up or uh, development of uh, Theresa's question, and I'm I'm very glad to hear um, that sort of you would sort of um, use Shinsa if you were to focus on a single confusion because I I completely agree. <laughs> um, but so my question is related to that in this sense. Um, I worry um, the extent to which you know, speaking of um, something closer to uh, Kassir's vision of symbolic form as a Confucian idea obscures uh, certain features of um, both intra-Confucian disputes as well as um, its broader sort of ph philosophical context, mainly because I think I take, I mean, one of the reasons why I think Shinzi is fascinating, I think is it's underappreciated to me the extent to which his criticism of Mengzi is not, is, is really a, a question of um, the extent to which Confucian culture needs to be understood as a historical and social project as opposed to one that's uh, sort of returned to some kind of innate natural, um, in a narrow sense of the natural um, uh, moral sort of source. And this is also, I think, crucial to understanding sort of the broader uh, context of, you know, a kind of suspicion of uh, the Rentao in sort of certain primitivist or Taoist um, accounts and also, so I, I guess part of my, what I'm asking is, um, yeah, I mean, to what extent um, do you, well, I mean, I, I, I'd love to read your book sometime, I'm just wondering to what extent do you account for that in, in the book and um, just in terms of understanding sort of Confucianism as a sort of tradition? Yeah. Um... Yeah, so, so yeah, first of all, I, I, I like Sunzi because I think he does talk about, um, he, I think he's, so when he talks about the ritual of burial forms, it's such a brilliant example of the relationship of having particular cultural forms and what it does for, 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 for the human being. So, you know, when you, when, you know, I forget the exact stages, but on the first day, 
that when somebody dies, you have to put them this distance from you, otherwise you will you will feel too scared or something. But then on another on the third day, you have to put them this far away from you, otherwise um, you will have feelings of disgust, etc. So he really, I think he really describes the the, the role that these kind of um, socially derived cultural forms have for 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 you know for on the individual level but then also on the collective social level um and his um but the thing is i think so he came after mencius um i i always feel like his disagreement with mencius isn't as big as it's it gets played out because i don't think that i mean i think you're right that you know it's much more individualistic you have this in mencius you have like a you just naturally you're going to tend towards kind of goodness is much more individualistic in some in, in a certain sense much more individualistic but i don't think mentions ever said that um you know your four sprouts could just develop without human society i don't think you would ever you know that's ever within the question is all he's never going to deny the importance of ritual and you know music these things so it, for me it always seemed like the two people placed there they basically had very similar ideas about how, about how it is human beings flourish, but that they just put, put their emphasis in different places. You know, I don't, you know, because Mencia says that a human, um, that you need uh, these uh, cultural forms, but then that also implies that by nature, human beings are to some extent good, because if there was nothing to build off of, like no amount of, you know, ritual, or whatever is ever going to perfect a human being. So I don't, you know, ultimately, I don't, even though he says human nature is bad, but I think that's partly also, I think, you know, rhetorical to make his point of the how importance of ritual and, and such. Um, um, okay, so, well, the other question was, oh, the, the, the divergence between all the different kind of conf confusions and whether I pay, a, yeah, so, um, so because I, well, because I wanted to just like pick out this common theme of uh, of culture within the, all the confusion, so yes, I do end up just um, you know not really paying so much attention to all the the, the, the nuances and di differences among the different confusions. But then I do think you know because for me, from my kind of rhetorical perspective, I was more just trying to emphasize that look this this humanistic idea of the human creation of form is something that is that has to be recognized as a very important part of Confucianism. Yeah. So unfortunately, yes, yeah, so, you know, because I was trying to do that, I perhaps didn't have much time to, to do all of this, you know, to give due notice to other things. So, so I hope that um, answers. Thanks. I mean, I, 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 I don't know if, if there's time for a quick follow-up. Um, Go ahead. No, all right, this will be our last question. <laughs> Right. So, sorry about that. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe what I want to press on is is the extent. So, on one on the one hand, I, I completely agree that um, I I agree that the differences between uh, Mengzi and Shinzi have perhaps been overblown. Um, but the way I would angle it is in a way it's overblown because of this emphasis on the slogan, you know, um, or but and and as a dispute about uh, seeing or human nature and. I don't think that's the best way to understand the dispute, but I think that the, the core of the dispute is actually pretty close to this question of what is the role of uh, human agency? Um, and to me, it seems that, well, if, if, if what's crucial is the creation of, of human form as, as something that adorns nature as opposed to um, a, is, a, is a sort of representation of, of forms that we find in nature already, uh, sort of fully uh, uh, there, then I think there is a difference because there, in, in, with Mengzi, it's, it's, there's very much this emphasis on sort of, well, Liangzi is what you find in the heart as it is. Um, and it's something that's almost, a, you, 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 you discover it by going in a way to the origin, uh, whereas for Shinsa, it's very much uh, not that. <laughs> and I think that that's a crucial, at least in terms of uh, when you're putting it in conversation with Kassir on symbolic forms, I think that that's a pretty important difference. So that's that's where I'm coming from. I, I, yeah. I wonder if... Okay, yeah. yeah, I get that, and especially for the later new Confucians, the way that they took on this, uh, give this kind of real huge cosmological significance to the human nature. Yeah, I see that.
yeah um yeah and uh, if i speak to that uh yeah um yeah so i think yeah i guess that so perhaps that the, you know that's one thing i this, this kind of maybe quite crucial difference is something i had to sacrifice in order to yeah i tried, i really because i wanted to make this point about the you know this the, the, the importance of um civilization for for and it's you know for for broadly for confusions um but you know maybe yeah maybe i could have uh, put like a kind of you know put a note in there to clarify a bit more but yeah but thank you there i haven't because i haven't really thought about it but i just i just like said oh it's okay like i i really thought about this mentions and students i think they're kind of quite similar blah 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 but yeah i think yeah I mean, you kind of I think you're also right to kind of remind me that it's um, especially, I think now I think of the way that the new Confucius to come mentions. Thanks. All right. Sorry, uh, I, didn't, I didn't mean to be to come across as, as too, too critical. I think the the I I love the project. It, it sounds uh, it's really good. I think um, so. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. Um. Thank you very much. So uh, let's bring this to a close, and I'm gonna pause uh, the recording. And uh, but then people are welcome to stay a little uh, uh, after I ended this.